All right, Kiss Army. Welcome to the Kiss FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today. Nothing is into your head. I hope you don't do any damage. This is a Kiss-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. Welcome to episode 198 of the Kiss FAQ Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill, and I am joined by, hey, it's the usual guys. So, Lonnie, St. Louis Kiss, uh, 69th Blizzard, Ken, and uh-huh. not Andrew, Marcus Almighty, Mark. Greetings. Oh, gentlemen, we put the band back together once again. And this is episode number eight for the month, so someone smack me upside the head if I do this in September, because uh, it's absolutely stupid. And I don't think uh, people can catch up with all the KISS podcasts that there are. And, you know, at the National Rock and Pod Expo, Michael Butler was asking me on tape, how many KISS podcasts are? Like, there's hundreds, man. He doesn't like KISS podcasts, by the way. So I was just like, there's hundreds. Sometimes it feels that way, but there aren't. All right. So I've mentioned it. National Rock and Pod, KISS FAQ, was there on his own. Some, And he missed Mark and Lonnie. Um mm. But he was very cl- he was very close to the bar, and they had they had Yingling. Yeah, I was a bit jealous of your pictures. <laughs> yeah, Ying, Yingling was had, as was uh, Fat Tire. But uh, Chris and Zach, everyone involved in organizing that event, my hat off to you. Did a wonderful job. Vinny was not missed. Everyone had a lot of fun. It was really positive. It was entertaining. Uh, when you're sitting there in your podcasting booth, it was a much better layout than last year at this venue. But uh, just to turn around and see Punky Meadows and uh, Frank sitting like a foot from you being interviewed, it was like, holy crap, that's Angel <laughs> right beside me and uh, Ron Keel walking around the place and the guys from Tora Tora. Uh, Greg and Steve from Lipstick. Uh, you know, it, it was just, there were so many people there. The podcasters were all very awesome. Had a lot of good times with everyone. And, uh, you know, check out episode 197 of this show. Uh, I interviewed a lot of the podcasters to get their KISS stories and thoughts, but also interviews with Vinnie Vincent's drummer on uh, Guitar Mageddon and Guitar Some Hell, Andre LaBelle. And he was absolutely brilliant, absolutely incredible guy. Uh, we only had 15 minutes or so to, to talk, but um, great stories, very respectful, very, very interesting first-hand stories. Also spoke with uh, Doob and uh, Brendan Harkin from Stars, which uh, a lot of KISS stories there. And I did straight up ask one of the questions that's been on my mm. mind for many years and got a, uh, I'd say, a pretty interesting answer. To, but you'll have to go uh, just wait through there. If you're not interested in hearing from the podcasters, those interviews are very worthwhile. So here's to hoping 2019 brings Rock and Pod 3. And um, do it all again with a different batch of guests. It was definitely more fun this year interviewing people than kind of being a, a vendor, which is all I did last year. And then it was sitting next to me last year. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> yeah, that's what you, you know, I, <laughs> it was being nice. I, I think if we had taken advantage of what the Rock and Pod is really about, which is podcasting, um, last mm-hmm. year, we I think it would have been more interesting, but you know, going into the first one, didn't quite know what it was going to be, only knowing one side of Expos, you know, again, didn't know what it was going to be. This year, you know, I didn't get a lot of foot traffic by me, so I, I didn't sell much, but uh, you know, I did sell a couple of things, and I do thank people who uh, came over and bought or shopped or perused, whichever. So it, it was all good. Um, Before we get into today's show, I do want to just cut away for 15 minutes and uh, just add in something with Alan Valicia, who has the Originals Plus One Kiss Japan photo book coming out in September. I spoke to him for, you know, a little bit this morning and, uh, you know, check this out. All right. So I'm joined for a brief intermission by our good friend Alan, all the way from Japan. Good to see you again, Alan. Good to see you. Hi, how are you? Doing well. So obviously, um, you said you were kind of done with magazines, and you're not, aren't you? You, you, well, you, you've decided to come back from retirement and uh, gift us all another amazing installation of or installments from the archives of uh, Shinko. So why don't you let everyone know what you've been working on and how this latest project came about? 
Yes, you know, every time I say it's the last one, but every time I've been pulled in the archives and I just say I can't let those stay where they are. They need to see the light of day. So that's what happened when I went uh, in uh, in their offices back in February uh, when I uh, pay uh, homage, pay uh, my respect and give them some copies of the Budokan 78 magazines. They were very nice and we had a little chat and I said, you know, I have another idea about something and, you know, they listened politely. I put the idea forward and then I, I waited for a few months and um, talked to them again, uh, I think it was around June and said, this is, this is my new project, this is my new idea, what do you think? And uh, again, to their credit, they uh, they they went ahead, and uh, we, uh, we were managed to uh, put uh, another fantastic book of uh, the Music Life uh, archives for uh, for everyone to enjoy. And it's called uh, the Originals Plus One. It's a very um, ambitious on my part because it's over a, it's 130 pages. If you're familiar with the magazines that um, I produced uh, a couple years ago, Tokyo Takes Tokyo 77 and Budokan 78, they were 72 pages, which was more like a magazine format. This one is almost double, it's 130. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very excited. And I had some great news earlier this week as well in that um, it will be officially licensed by KISS. So you can see the smile. How, I'm, I'm, how, I'm how, how, how does that work? Because, you know, obviously having the logo is a big deal and having mm -hmm. sort of the business relationship with the band and their licensing arm um, is also, a, you know, a very tall mountain to climb. So how, how did mm. that come about? Um, you know, as much as you can tell us, because obviously there is a business involved in that that you won't be able to speak about. Yes, there is a, a non-disclosure clause in, in in the contract, indeed. But um, well, if I knew how 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 easy it is, I would have done it from the first one. Uh, but it, I don't I don't know how it works because it's on their side. Um, so yes, it's I I imagine it's the um, the um, the resume, the, especially the last one. I think Budokan seventy eight uh, looked was a stunning magazine it was. absolutely it was yes indeed um i i was very proud of it the the photos the quality was 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 awesome and and they saw it and they remembered it and so i think that played the, i guess the biggest part in when i approached them this time and uh yeah that's all i can say i think was uh was that they liked it and they they trusted me so uh, you know, that's one thing leading to another. Also, be, being able to work closely with Shinko Music, being, of course, they, they had a relationship uh, with the band for over 40 years, uh, also helped. So I'm um, sort of the, 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 the go-between, and uh, and it worked. I, I don't know. It's it's a miracle. I'm, 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 I was very excited and very... I'm, I'm ter and terrified at the same time. But, uh, yeah, it will have the KISS logo on the cover, and that's... Uh, I'm super proud of that. I, I, I don't think you should be terrified because the quality of your work has spoken for itself very clearly. About thank whether, you, thank whether you. Whether it was the Kiss in Japan book or the two photo specials, and obviously you did do a reprint of the the first one. Um, you know, yes. I, I have heard nothing but good superlatives about the the photo magazines and Thank the book. You. I haven't heard a single criticism about a single letter or <laughs> character in any of those books. I, I mean, that in itself speaks of the standard of attention that you're putting into these. What, if anything, how would you say that this photo book, other than its size, which is, you know, we, we could go into all sorts of Gene Simmons uh, comments about the size being bigger, but how is it different from the previous two? Obviously, your last publication was Budokan 78. The previous yes. one was Budokan 77. Um Takes Tokyo seven seven takes yeah takes yes. Tokyo. Um, mm -hmm. You know how how is this going to you know the originals plus one? What are people going to be able to expect from it pictorially? Does it have a theme running through it, or you know define it for us? Yes, uh, well the title if hopefully is self explanatory. The originals plus one. 
Um, it really will cover the, uh, the Music Life archives from 1975 to 1980. And so that's the theme. And I consider it more a photo book or like a tour program than, than, than a book. I am not going heavy on text because I'm not going to rehash the same story for the third or fourth time. You know, they arrived in Haneda Airport and Omega. No, I think everyone knows that. It's eye candy from, from, from page one to the last one. So there are photos, portraits, high quality photos. You know, you may have seen a few in music life in black and white on newspaper quality, the size of a postage stamp. This time you'll see it in full color, full page. So it's kind of a crossover between a magazine and a tour program. So lots of photos, um, mostly photos, portraits of the originals plus one, which of course, I hope everyone has guessed is Eric Carr. Yeah, I, I, I would certainly hope that they had guessed it. You know, you spent a lot of time in the Shinko, um, you know, photographic archives. Just how much do they have? I mean, here we are on now on a 130 page booklet or book. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I apologize. I just called it a booklet that really doesn't <laughs> do it justice. But yeah, how, how much do they have and how do you go about the process of deciding which photos to use? Do you go in and say, I like this, I like this, I like this, and then have to negotiate um, with them about which ones they will allow to be used? Or do you have mm -hmm. a much more free hand in saying, here's the project, the number of pictures we need? Yeah, and, and how does it kind of work when you're putting together this project? Okay. Well, maybe to, to, to explain a bit how, how it's different. The first one I did, the, the Kiss in Japan book, um, I had very limited access because they didn't know me. I was introduced through, um, 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 what do you say, a, a connection. So they were kind enough to let me choose a few, but I wanted this one, and no, this one we can. Oh, this one, no, this one we can. So it was a bit frustrating for, for, for the first one. Um, things got a little better with Takes Tokyo, and things got a little better with Budokan 78. And just, just to, for this one, basically that, that day I went in and they had everything over on the table and I said, okay, um, go ahead, we'll call us if you need us. And I was by myself, you know, with the archives. And they, to, to their credit, they were really, really kind and, searched thoroughly through uh, the physical archive. So had, I was looking at posi films, you know, like slides on a table with lights, not the digi their digital archives. And I think a few people have had access. Unfortunately, some may have leaked uh, here and there, but the, uh, the, the physical ones, they really pulled them from the vaults. And those you have never seen. I had never seen them. And yes, they're the more you look, the more you find them. So that will be quite a few of those in uh, in this one, in the original plus one. So to answer your question, yes, whenever there's a photo, I, I'm, you know, I can't believe it hasn't been published in 42 years. I pick it and I choose it, and 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 these ones will publish. So yeah they have uh, they have tons and i'm sure there's more that uh, they haven't been able to find or they haven't had access i'm sure they have even more photos still ready to go now you answered one of the questions i was going to ask you which was what form does their archive take digital or or um physical mm. you know in terms of uh yeah of slides um yes how and they have and they have prints as well Oh, so all all three ways yes. of going through. Yes. How yes. good are how good are their notes on for you to determine? Uh, and I don't know how much you include in in the uh, in the book about who took the photographs and when. Uh, well, that's relatively easy if you read Japanese because the the original articles in Music Life tell you where the photos were taken. So you have the time frame, you see the tour, the year, 76, August 76, Dayton, Ohio, for example. You know the photographer is David Tan. You know Kohasebe is in Tokyo. So, no, I actually sometimes tell them, oh, by the way, this photo is this, this photo is that. So, yeah, just 
to show you a couple of photos here. So I, I also had um, prints. They have they had prints. So this is one of one one photo that was printed. I think in a rock show magazine. You have notes in the back. So they're like the real deal. They're, and oh. and I've seen so many photos that were printed in the Music Life magazine. So I was like, oh my god, this is like historic, you know. And so you have tons of photos that have not been published in print, in slides, and then uh, digital. So you have a mix of three. And that's what I, I've been spending my time going through again and again and again and again. So this isn't a full episode. This is an interruption um, to get the word out about this project. What are your I really appreciate it. What are your timelines involved in bringing Kiss in Japan's the originals plus one to print where where are you at in the process um right now i'm taking pre-orders and i've decided to celebrate the um the licensing of kiss to offer a free poster uh if you pre-order the book before september 7th give and take a day or two because i know people are always late so um i'm I'm about to, I'll, I'll go to print um, right after that, so mid-September, and we're looking at sh starting shipping uh, end of September. And and what I do recall from the last several that I purchased from you is you ship fast. You also ship very well protected, and uh, multiple copies always end up in the most perfect condition. I've never had anything arrive from Japan, actually, in bad condition or not properly packaged. So uh, thank you for how respectfully you handle your magazine. Where can people? Thank you for the kind words. Where can people find you to order this book? Thank that's a very good question. You go to www.kissinjapan.com in one word. Kissinjapan.com. You have a selection for worldwide. You can buy one copy, which is 5,000 yen, including shipping, register shipping, or two copies for 9,000 because you save a bit on, on combined shipping. So uh, don't delay your order if you want to buy it because they are always limited editions and they sell out fast. Yeah, let me just reiterate that. They sell out fast. You won't get lucky like you did at the Indie Expo where I happen to have some copies of the reprint and every single person who came up to me was, I can't believe I missed this. I, no, don't miss it. So speaking as yeah, someone I, who's I, on the other I, side of the coin, don't miss it because they do I sell out. So, I get so many emails after it sells out. It breaks my heart, but I'm like, look, I've been advertising this for weeks. Yep. I'm really sorry. I really don't have any more copies. And still to this day, to, till now, people are asking me about the Kiss in Japan book, which has been out of print for, for almost two years now. So, yes, uh, if you want it, get it now. Absolutely. Or go on eBay and see what the other ones are selling for. If you need a reminder to why you want to buy it now directly from Alan, um, just yes, hop on eBay yes. because it's insane how much these are selling for and being offered for some some people send me links sometimes and, and i'm i'm shocked as myself so yeah okay any last words about it other than do it no i hope everyone enjoys it it's uh i'd like to say it's the, the the successors to the music life encyclopedias that's what i'm i'm humbling uh aiming for um kiss uh from the music life archives 130 pages you know, the originals plus one. How could you not want it? Well, brilliant. I can't wait <laughs> for it. And, uh, you know, again, congratulations on officially licensed by KISS. That's a, a very you. impressive milestone for you, to, for you to have reached with your project. All right, let's get back to the regular show, kissinjapan.com. And you can also find Alan on Facebook. Don't miss the opportunity to purchase this because you will regret it. Um, and as I said, go on eBay and see what the previous installations are selling for because they have gone way up. Mm. Okay, thanks, Thank Alan. You, Jillian. Thank you so much. All right, we're back. Hopefully that's uh, useful information for you. Just uh, another reminder on that. Do not miss the opportunity or you will get gouged on eBay or by other sellers. It's better to buy it straight out of the bat and get it directly from Alan yourself. It's a good value. All right, other news. Um, we really want to go there. Yeah, Gene Simmons and Ace Frehley have landed in Australia. They did the... Uh, Adelaide vault and concert has been done. Uh, the set lists were about what I expected. 
Ace did bring talk to me back. But I think uh, probably ought to let the clip play for itself. And this is Gene Simmons on stage in Adelaide. So. <laughs> Do I not want to sing? I'll sing everything. Because my voice always works. I don't lose my voice. Test one, two. I don't lose my voice, Paul Stanley. You know I love him. You really got me? Oh, fuck him. No. Okay, I asked Ace if he wants to sing. All right, so... What are your thoughts on that? I mean, joking or not, is kind of calling out Paul's voice on stage. Um, good or bad magic, Lonnie? Damn, Gina, that's what I got to say about that. That's crazy. I mean, I guess it is the elephant in the room. Mm. But for him to, to say that is, is kind of surprising. Nonetheless, even you know, you know, Gene's very candid, but it, it's it's surprising for Gene to to basically call Paul out when Paul's not even there to defend himself. I think that's kind of uh, kind of being like Paul Stanley and being yeah. like, mean to oh, Gene yeah. when Gene's not there to defend himself. That's true. Or, I mean, Paul's Gene, not the Gene, or Gene being but there. Paul, but, but let's be honest, Paul's the boss. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest here. Sad so, band etiquette. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly right, Mark. All I right. mean, because Mark, you've been you, in, you've you, been in bands. You know all about the band dynamics. Uh, so, yeah. what, what's your take on it? I I don't think it was very cool to be honest. I mean, sure, he, will Paul take it seriously? Who knows? Maybe they joke about that off stage. I don't think they do, but I think it's a very touchy subject, if you ask me. I mean, you really think Paul wants to have this voice problem? I really don't think he does. And for him to go out on stage and to kind of, you know, make light of it like that in front of an audience like that, a KISS audience, no doubt, I think that's that's pretty uncool. I, I think that uh, if he got a heated phone call from Paul, I wouldn't be too surprised because if somebody did, if I was in a band with somebody and they did that to me, I, w I wouldn't stand for it, so... No, you, you have to show you have to show unity. You have to show strength together. He should he shouldn't be making fun of it. He should be making, you know, saying stuff to make Paul look stronger rather than weaker. Build him up, not knock him down. Yeah. So I actually went on Paul's Twitter just to see if there was anything. Um, no, the last thing really of any consequence that Paul has posted there is happy birthday, Gene, my partner for over 49 years. We built this all together and I could never have done it alone. You're my brother and I'm blessed to see the lives we have chosen made possible for each of us. Much left to do and the road lies ahead. Well, maybe it did, but uh, <laughs> Ken, how do you take it? Well, first I thought, ooh, did he really do that? <laughs> and... Uh... I say it did, and then I thought about it like, uh, okay, well, maybe it was coming. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think about all the things that Paul said about Gene over the years, and I thought, and Gene doesn't, it just rolls off his back. He, he don't, he doesn't care what people call him. Um, but you know, I know Paul's a little thinner skinned, so it may, it may kind of, get on his nerves the other thing is kind of i started thinking about uh, back about the other that deal uh video a while back i don't know years back where paul uh where paul was singing they were singing or they were doing the uh a pre-concert thing one of their sessions or whatever it was and gene is saying to paul you know save your voice yeah i think he was uh, starting voice. to sing some of nowhere to run <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so yeah, he's like, Save your voice. and Paul looks over and like, he just ignores him and and <laughs> goes on, you know. It, so I I don't know. It's it's just I don't think any harm's really done. There's probably other things they say to each other that we don't even know about uh, <laughs> behind the scenes. So yeah, it's probably yeah, like Mark said, bad etiquette, band etiquette. Uh, but again, they're like brothers, and brothers tend to do 
things like that sometimes. Uh, so I, I'm okay. I'm okay with it. Uh, it's just, it's uh, kind of surprising that he actually did do it, you know. And okay. again, maybe not surprising because Gene tends to, you know, say things, you know, by accident. Yeah, and I, I, I'm going to be the Thinks devil's advocate here, you know, because Gene had, had clearly said when he was doing the meet and greets um, in Adelaide that he'd basically been on a plane for 22 hours traveling from Quebec to mm. Toronto to Vancouver <laughs> to, and then directly to Sydney and then Sydney to Adelaide. So that is a hell of a lot of traveling, a lot of jet lag. They had basically, from what I understand, gotten in not too long before the actual event. So I'm going to give Gene the benefit of the doubt in terms of uh, jet lag and being under duress and, you know, not really thinking. Because it, uh, what people the were saying, was still present. Yeah, because yeah, because what people were saying about the show was he kept doing the crocodile Dundee. That's not a knife. This is a knife, and he did it like twenty times or something. And it got. They said it started getting annoying. Um, is he starting to partake in that uh, that marijuana thing that he's promoting, or what's yeah. going on with him? He's just sampling. Sampling. Too, right. too, too much of the cannabis oil rubbing it into his skin. It's like uh, maybe not such a good idea. So here's what I, I ultimately think. I agree with Mark that it's not something that should be said, regardless of what their relationship is. I don't know whether they're brothers or whether they're like stepbrothers, if you've seen the movie. Um, it, it, it really doesn't matter uh, at all. It's just one of those things that, to me, you don't mock someone's disability in public. And Paul, is that's his, his Achilles right now. And for for his pride and whatnot, that's a really low blow. But I don't think there was any malicious intent. I don't think he got up there and said, "I'm going to really stick the screw in Stanley today." You know, well, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah I, just watch this. Out. I'm down here with Ace and watch this. Watch what I'm going to do. Yeah. It, it's it. It almost seems like he seems to forget sometimes that the internet, you know, what the internet does. Like it actually does transmit what you're saying at that moment. To millions of people around the world it's almost like he's oblivious to it still like that you know oh i didn't realize that somebody would have heard my comments almost you know he almost <laughs> seems odd at, like it almost has this reaction like oh i didn't realize that it would have carried so far over to everybody who made such a big deal out of it but you know you should know by now that you got to watch what you say sometimes in these kind of ev events they'll come back to bite you right yeah, it's a, yeah it said, magnifies drama the internet yeah, yeah. having said that the, the, the audience probably they they all they all know. <laughs> he doesn't have to tell them. Paul, they already know Paul's having some uh, vocal issues. So if they're, you know, they're big Kiss fans. So. Yeah, I, I, at this point, if anyone denies that there are vocal issues in the band, then uh, you're obviously as deaf as Ace Frehley. So. <laughs> No, it, yeah. it, it really I'm is. There. We are we are past the point of denying it or being polite um, in our denials. It is what it is. Paul obviously still wants to keep going, and that is Paul's prerogative. Everyone else will have to make their choice. And uh, again, judging him by YouTube is not fair. It does magnify what is versus what you have when you're in the experience and have had 17 beers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I obviously, yeah. I obviously took uh, lessons in diplomacy from Gene Simmons today. No, I, I think part of it too is, and I think it's an excellent point that I don't think Gene realizes when he says something that everyone out there has a phone and everyone out there is yeah. already videotaping what he's saying, that he's talking to more than just the thousand or two thousand people, whoever are in that small theater. He, I don't think he he realizes that all the time, yeah. that, that he's talking to more people than just the people that are looking at him. And then yeah. anything he says is going to be broadcast for the whole world to hear. Sure. So if Gene was a dog, he'd be a big, dumb retriever. No idea. <laughs> Just drooling, shaking his head. And Paul's a chihuahua. Because he's a or bite. a big hound. He'll bite your balls off. <laughs> Snips his head. So, you know, whatever. Un I, I think unfortunate. But uh, there you go. At uh, this stage in their career, will it have any effect on anything? Probably not, because if they hate each Probably other not. already, nothing's going to fix that. It, you know, like like right. Paul said, 50 years together, you pretty much know everything about the other person and maybe how to tweak them. So that's a possibility, yeah. too, yeah. that he said it deliberately to get a rise out of Paul. Who knows? So Maybe. 
maybe Gene doesn't want to do the uh, end of the road tour, and that's his way of trying to piss Paul off into not doing it. It's breaking up, or just fading away. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe the little run that they did. Maybe they're not getting good deals for you know who knows. Well, everything mm. that could be happening. Maybe he's just enjoying the solo exactly. tour too much. Well, he's rapidly catching up on the number of uh, solo shows that Paul's performed during his two runs, so who knows? Does, I, I don't think it really matters. Let's just talk a little bit more about Australia. Has uh, everyone had a chance to check out the set list and whatnot? Any thoughts yeah. on the vault events? Because Adelaide certainly seems like it was a winner. They did the show the night before. Um, purchaser of the, purchasers of the vault were able to attend the sound check which was an absolute disaster, apparently, because it was the first time Ace met the Gene Simmons band guys. Oh, no. So, yeah. uh, and he had guitars that wouldn't stay in tune. Ace is very particular. So, uh, we've yeah. seen. I know you saw that. I think uh, I saw that. The, the Joe O'Dell uh, guitar fetching. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, he tried three different ones that morning. So that that's He's very particular. That's not surprising. I thought the Gene Simmons guys did a fantastic job backing Ace. With there was a lot more harmony going on from those guys. And as far as I'm concerned, you can't have too many guitars. So Ace was just mm-hmm. Ace was sloppy. Ace was tired. Um, you know, again, it is what it is. I was a little disappointed in the Gene set that he didn't have "Are You Ready." Um, Mm. or it's my life or something from the vault i mean obviously he sold the damn thing and he's not going to get any more sales in australia because everything's been shipped out there but i think it would have been nice for for fans who weren't able to um thoughts on the set lonnie um it's, it was very predictable i thought um it, it was safe and predictable i I'm, I'm with you that i i really like what he was doing with with are you ready and with it's my life and things like that. You know, and he, that's, I mean, let's be honest. That's why he's down there is, is to sell the vaults. No, there's, he's not going to sell any more vaults because he played, are you ready? Or he played, it's my life, but that's why he's down there. I mean, I was, what really surprised me is that he played, I was made for loving you because we've all heard over the years, how much Gene doesn't like, I was made for loving you. And we do that because Paul likes it. And we do, I love it loud because Gene likes it. And you know, the opposite, mm-hmm guy doesn't really care for for it so i was surprised that he that he did that um but everyone in australia but everyone in australia likes, loves, uh, i get uh, it i get it he's playing allegedly to you you can't go into a house and not see the single hanging on the wall it's everywhere <laughs> probably probably not probably they want to hear it as about as much as we do it's like shandy mm-hmm. but she's so european still being in there is cool all the way i love all the way just regardless of him doing that's awesome too mm-hmm. and plaster caster is cool so yeah. there's there's some good things in there as well, but I was just surprised by I was surprised by no no exclusive vault material, and I was made for loving you kind of threw me a curveball. Although I look instead of a partial two timer and a partial love, I'm leaving it would have been cool if you would have worked that those out all the way because those would have been great to hear in their entirety. The, the there's one thing though in there that I that I really kind of thought was cool that he's been doing, and uh, I I heard it the first time actually on the Kiss Room I think when they were playing segments of his show was I like how he's doing this love theme from kiss into war machine. I think, it, I think that sounds really kind of cool. It's something I didn't really expect to hear him do. Uh, and they play it really good. And I mean, and especially because they have three guitar players, they can really do it justice properly. That song, you know, it sounds really cool that way. Um, and I'm, I'm with Lonnie. I really think that she's so European and all the way are great additions to the set or, or great songs to have in the set. Anyways, and uh, I agree. I'm surprised also about the I was made for loving you bit. Um, I have to admit, I didn't watch any of the set, but I am kind of curious on the site here to say I was made for loving you with guest. Do you know who the guest was? Uh, Yeah, I was told three times today and I've forgotten every time since. They've had a female vocalist coming up um, and and doing that. So a girl and from Uh. um, from what one of the reviews uh, said, and let me just get this user's name because you you type out the amount of stuff that uh, Mr. Slow. Uh, thank oh, yeah. you so much for your review because I, he wrote about 5,000 words. I mean, lots, of, yeah, lots of details. Head over to the Kiss FAQ and check out that thread. You know, it is just the amount of detail that he put into the review is absolutely wonderful. So I know, Mark, I don't remember who the, the, the female vocalist was on that because I never 
got back to editing that thread other than taking out some of the the songs that were on the set list that weren't performed um watching yeah. you, watching you being one from on jeans that wasn't done in detroit rock city on aces was not done somebody said something on the board yeah. the other day that that they're really surprised that he and i agree with this that he's hasn't attempted to do unholy for any of these solo shows mm. He played a riff of it, I think, in he did uh, Grona Lund, I, I think. And Julian, you're smarter than I am. But... I, it has nothing to do I with smarts. I thought he did it once. I, I'm just making it up as I go. Recently. No, I'm... no they, they, play, they, they definitely played the riff, and Gene responded on stage like, ooh, that'd be a good idea. Duh. No shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, you know, these uh, songs that were missing that we – expect him to do like you know it's my life and and uh whatever the other one is <laughs> i can't remember that now myself but uh it would have been are nice you ready? for him yeah are you ready um it would have been nice for him to throw them a bone and not do maybe i was made for love you um and do attempt naked city um, or, or or another, so, you know, because those albums, Dynasty and Unmasked, were huge down there in Australia. Yeah. So do those songs, do that. Try even, uh, you know, X-ray eyes. Well, they did know? last night. To be fair, uh, and this is Melbourne last night or tonight because they're a day ahead of us. Um, when Ace came out to do, he, he comes out for the last song in Adelaide, so just does rock and roll all night. Last night he came out and did Let Me Go, Rock and Roll, and Rock and Roll All Night with Gene. And apparently uh, they, they played a bit of uh, Torpedo Girl, which I, I think was probably about as successful uh, yeah, as when he did that for us in Los Angeles. So, you know, that that's, that's kind of cool. But then again, this isn't just for the vault people. So in terms of it being kind of a generalist Gene Simmons set, you know, I think it's a, an, a very fair effort. He's got charisma mm -hmm. in there. He's yeah. got radioactive in there, sweet right. pain, uh, which I can't remember if that was complete and whatnot. And I think as Lonnie said, uh, likes the love theme from kiss into war machine that, I that. okay. I said. Yeah, sorry, Mark. Uh, <laughs> <give you credit. laughs> I, 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 I love that. And you know, she's so Europeans in there. So yeah. In terms of uh, songs for diehards, I think he hits most of the spots. Can he ever hit all of them? No. Well, he's just not going to do an electric version of My Uncle is a Raft. So <laughs> not, not going to happen. Try it. Hallelujah. He's, no, it's not going to happen. But he's also got the other songs that are kind of obligatory. You know, nothing to lose and deuce. So. Sure. And he and he does the he does throw people a bone by doing I was made for loving you without having to sing it himself or torture the the residency guys. Um, Ace is set very similar to what was done on his previous tour there, so there's really not much in there. It, again, I think it's adequate, and uh, I think it was uh, Phil Schaus was singing Love Gun on there according to the notes, but I haven't. Uh, seen enough recordings on that so i mean all in all I'll, I'll say one thing that does surprise me and people have commented on this is there isn't a lot of gene well there's no gene merchandise gene simmons from kiss shows up for a solo tour and has nothing to sell you who would have thought <laughs> kind of weird huh? is that an oxymoron or what <laughs> that, I, I mean and australians please do correct us if we're wrong uh, because we don't want to present anything that is not accurate deliberately uh you know so chime in wherever you listen to this and say if if there was stuff i know there were bootleg shirts being sold outside um in adelaide i believe could be melbourne it's like every show you go to yeah, yeah. you know and they were gene simmons ace fairly <laughs> tour shirts uh gene did have that nice lithograph of kind of the medusa head uh, but i think that was given to the the vault people so i'm not not certain how that's um kind of being handled but you know he has an opportunity to do a bad ass gene simmons tour shirt mm -hmm. Yeah, and and at this point, I really think, uh, and and this comes off, you know, uh, talking with Alan this morning. I'm like, I'm putting together the tour history right now for the Gene Simmons solo band. Why isn't there a tour magazine or a tour book? You know, uh, Keith and yeah. the crew have put together two very good Kiss books uh, or magazines in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Why not put together one for Gene that's got interviews with the members of the band, interview with Gene tour dates sets uh and shitloads of photos from all of the shows and boom presto you've got a tour book you've got a 
commemorative of the Gene Simmons solo band, and you've got 25 bucks in your pocket. So Yeah, it, it, it is very strange that he wouldn't have brought something. And I mean, the, uh, I was watching that interview that he did on that Australian television show that you posted there, Julian, and uh, he, he mentioned it himself, that they had 5,000 items with Kiss on it. I mean, he didn't think to bring maybe like a few of them or make a couple of different things to bring. I mean, that that, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. And, and like you said, that he he doesn't go he doesn't go to Australia very often. Kiss never goes to Australia that often as it is. So the chances for him to make a killing on merch is there. So I I don't know. Maybe it just was bad timing. Maybe they didn't get stuff done in time. Who yeah, knows? Yeah, I, what I the mean, they, is. they only had eight months to prepare. <laughs> Yeah, these shows were announced a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know then because I mean, it does seem it does seem odd that he wouldn't have brought it. There, there has to be some sort of reason. I think I, I'd hate to think it's just uh, I didn't think of bringing it. You know, well, you could always blame Bob Ezrin. Yeah, that'd be good. He's no, behind it for sure. No, no, I mean, it, how hard in terms of shipment? Money bags, hats, even something as simple as that. Uh, or yeah. if he hasn't given it all out in vaults, dragonfly clothing, T-shirts, you know. Yeah. So Ace had merch. All kinds of things. I, th I think it was mostly scraps, but Ace certainly had merch. So I, again, it's only four shows. Maybe it wasn't deemed worthwhile, especially once they saw the ticket sales. I think there were eleven hundred last night at uh, a venue that holds five thousand. So it is what it is. All right. So let's get into uh, one of the other topics for today. And, uh, Ken, how about you? How about me? Um, another one. <laughs> well, I was thinking about, and this kind of goes into the, uh, the tour, what they just did, and then the upcoming, um, tour, the, uh, into the road tour that's supposed to happen starting, what we were told, Jan starting January sometime. January the 20th. Uh, yeah, so... I'm thinking January like, the twentieth. Ha ha! Paul's birthday. Huh? Oh, there you go. Okay. Julian, Julian's going to say, the false you know something. But anyway, um, <laughs> I know nothing. I've heard nothing. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, when are when are they going to announce this? Because usually you have lead time, good lead time to for selling tickets um, on future dates. And a lot of these other bands that are out there, shoot, I see it a year ahead of time. Um, or at least six months ahead of time. So I'm thinking, well, when are they going to announce it? So I'm starting to think that maybe, just maybe that in October uh, is going to be a the big month for KISS. Um, with, I think they're going to have some releases that month. Um, maybe even that, I'm hoping that Colored Vinyl, um, uh, the solo albums that was, you know, I guess in the works. Um, plus, uh, maybe they'll finally announce it um, that the, the the tour dates and then the on sale dates for the tour. And October has always been a big month for Kiss in the past, so it kind of seems that maybe they'll they'll do it. I'm hoping they'll do it. Mark, it just seems to me it, it's why why is it, it hasn't been announced yet. Mark, you followed a lot of the big bands, um, you know, the Yeses, the other uh, ones who've done these m massive tours. I mean, what are your thoughts on kind of the announcement cycle for a band like Kiss if they are going to be going out on this monster three-year tour that Gene keeps telling everyone in private? Well, I mean, I think Ken has a point that usually um, when a band is planning to go on tour, let's say like in 2019... I mean, we're getting near September, like in a couple of days, okay? So you only have like, what, three months till the end of the year? And usually, from what I've always been told, you know, bands usually need to give themselves at least six months, you know, time ahead to like prepare for this stuff and to, you know, book all these things. And, you know, venues nowadays book up a hell of a lot faster than they did years and years back. So to get you know, your concert run done properly, you got to get on those venues as soon as possible. So either they've already went this far and already planned stuff and just haven't announced it yet, or they're planning to start this a lot later than we have anticipated. 
you know, I'm I'm hoping that they're going to start near the beginning of 2019. And if that's the case, they better be announcing it like soon, like what, what Ken's been implying, that maybe October is going to be the big month where they drop the gauntlet with everything. You know, there are these releases, the tour, everything. Maybe it's going to be the month that, you know, it's going to be like Kiss Month, you know? So I'm hoping that... that They're going to be doing it. Mark, are you like, not Mark. talking or are you completely frozen? I'm, no, I'm guessing. Is, is, okay. Has it frozen on here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you went no. Alvin and the Chipmunks on us. Oh, okay. Well, I was just saying that if, if they're going to get going on this, then they better be doing it in October. Otherwise, I'm guessing the tour will start a lot later in 2019, you know, because they need time to plan it, to book these venues and other things. And they need to, they need to get merch prepared and all kinds of stuff. There's a ton of stuff that you need to do when you do a tour, especially a big, huge world tour like this. I mean, I don't know what they're waiting for unless they have a specific plan. Like Ken's maybe hinting, maybe October's the month. They might just be waiting for Ace. <laughs> what? No, I, you know... I think October is when it happens in terms of when we've seen tour announcements previously. I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing some venues jumping the gun and accidentally put, put it, punching mm -hmm. Kiss into their calendars online. And people are just so aware of things nowadays and everything has is tied into Twitter, or into sign up emails that, you know, one will get out and then you'll know um, kind of when it happens. Yeah, the things I've heard usually contradict themselves within the next day and then come back to what I've heard. And so it, it really seems like the planning stage has been going on uh, actively. Um, and, and I'm really, to be honest, I'm none the wiser about when it. Sorry, I had to approve payroll. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good thing, Lonnie. Always. I, I want to make sure I get my <laughs> Yes. So, you know, I, I really, I, I don't have anything that I can even kind of suggest now. I mean, I thought I, I had some information at the weekend and no, I don't think so. That, that, you know, after time to parse it, it, it really doesn't seem to make much sense. But again, with the crews coming, with things that are happening around that, it seems to be the perfect kind of time and vehicle for that information to start um, being put out. But I, I think KISS probably at this stage wants to be very careful about what is planned. And I mean, we've talked about it before, that, and I'm still of a firm belief that it's not a straight three-year run. It's going to be a bunch of micro tours of maybe six to eight weeks a leg, uh, plenty of gaps in between to help all of them, and not just Paul's voice, but Gene's stamina. And that's how they've mm -hmm. done it the last several tours, even too. I mean, I mean when they when they did a live thirty five, I remember Gene being on some kind of interview, going, "Oh yeah, we've been we've been on tour for since two thousand eight, just straight." I'm like, well, no, you haven't. That's you know, <laughs> you really haven't because you toured Australia and then you took a couple months off, and then you toured Europe and then you took a couple months off, and then you toured South America and you took a couple months off. You know, and that it, that's that's going to be the same strategy that they're going to do when they do this final run as well. I mean, come on. Three-year tour that, that's 69 years old. No, that's not happening. Yeah, that's not it's not possible. There, and, then, and there isn't the demand for them to be playing every other night for three years straight. Come on. No, and I mean, even a lot of the big, like, legacy acts that are out now, too, they seem to be doing that as well, too. I've seen, like, Crimson and all these other bands where they do six weeks, take a few break, take a month or two off, and then they go back and do it again, and it's and it works well for bands like that. I think that's the the proper way to do it. You know, find your markets that are strong, and go to those places, and give yourself a bit of time. You know, and let people get excited about stuff again. You know, if you're going on it constantly all the time, you will start treading the same land over and over again, and then you'll start losing people, right? Yeah, and here's uh, just to kind of reinforce Mark's point. Def Leppard went out May the 21st, uh, finished June the 16th, out again July the 1st, and then uh, ended July 28th, then out again August the 11th. So, you know, lots of little legs here um, through September the 8th, and then a couple of weeks off in September the 20th. Oh, actually, I think I haven't finished filling in those dates, but, you know, lots of... Uh, 
you know, little segments. And Kiss is just magnified on that because they take much more time in between. Um, so I think USA comes first. I, I would hope so. And then I, I think, think so. six months later, you get Europe, maybe for the summer festival season again, as that just seems to be easy money in terms of being able to perform to very large crowds. Um, then I think they come back and have a good long break. And then early in 2020 is Australia or Japan or Japan. Mm -hmm. and, and then maybe another Lost Cities leg in Canada like they did. You know, Yay. It's, <laughs> well, Do you really see him tour in America in arenas in the winter, though? Well, it's not always winter everywhere. I understand that. True. But I, I I, see them, as much as I don't like like it, I see them more as a shed act in the summer than arenas in January, February, March, around that area. Yeah. I see the tour starting more overseas in like Australia and Japan, January, well, my, February, around that area, and then doing the festivals and then doing sheds after that or something like they've done before. Mind you, some of the places that get really bad winters, like Detroit and New York, are probably more of the hotbed places for Kiss. Though. Like Detroit, they probably do well no matter what and could probably play there in the winter and get decent attendance, right? So I kind of see how Julian's pre presenting it that maybe they'll start off in the – you know, the warmer climate areas like California, Texas, and all those places, and then, you know, gradually go to the spots that they know they're going to do well in, you know, like Detroit and, you know, New York. The mid, the, I always guess the Midwest is probably pretty strong for KISS, right? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually agree. Also, I, I agree with Lonnie and hadn't even considered the weather. So, Ken. I mean, I think it also depends on the who you got opening. I mean, who's the other band that's going to be there? Yeah, because there has to be another band. There has to be another band. It's got to be a pretty good band that's going to, you know, bring in some, uh, you know, other traffic, other, uh, you know. For sure. You know. It, it's too bad, bad buyers, that they've... You know? and, yeah, and it's too bad that they passed up on a couple of bands that they could have taken. I mean, the tour that's going around right now that's really good is Judas Priest Deep Purple. I'd love to go see that, you know. Uh, there's a good, you know. Just got my tickets for that. I'm super juiced. I haven't seen either of those bands um, missed out, so can't wait. But they're yeah. good. Priest is good, man. Yeah, I saw delivering the goods was done last night. Uh, I think mm -hmm. Mitch posted on his that they had uh, pulled that one out. Yeah. Um, again, I, I don't fucking care what that set list is. It's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be golden no matter what they perform. Same with Purple. So except for some of the mm -hmm. newer stuff that I haven't listened to. So. Uh, whatever back on topic um and therein lies the problem of which band kind of to package up with and then the schedules they i mean they must know at this point who they're going out with if they've partnered up or otherwise they're they're going out with a completely different format to what anyone's expecting and it'll be thousand dollar theater tickets <laughs> wow i don't see him doing that Okay. Because they're always like, they're always like, well, this show, this show, and this tour is, is bigger, this be the and more biggest, massive, and it's gonna be the biggest ever. Exactly. Show it, the every every tour is the biggest that... tour we've ever done. Yeah. They're okay. not gonna say, oh, we're gonna go out for our last tour. We're gonna play small theaters. Okay, we're gonna no. we're gonna go out and do arenas, half house format. Uh oh. Well, I don't hear it joining in all of a sudden. That's a sad. That's a. That's probably yeah. a, that's probably a blessing, oh. Ken. Uh oh. Ken, can you hear me? He's just ignoring me. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> His idiot filter has kicked in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, you know, my concern is arenas. Again, I we've seen how they haven't filled them over recent years. That's why I don't see them doing arenas. So you really think it would be a shed? Shed. Doesn't, I think sheds. Nothing but sheds. I don't like it. But I think it's a harsh reality. Well, I mean, Dave, but, but the thing I'm wondering about, too, is do they have already a, a set stage design? And will that fit in those sheds that you're talking about? Or do they kind of have arenas in mind when they made know. it? I think they kind of know this is yeah? this is where we're going to be playing. This is what needs to fit. Will it? There. Let's, 
That's why they took a whole year. I think it's it's taken a whole year to plan this thing. Well, I, I think, think they that's know. why they I have think... the year off. Yeah. So I think they had Doc McGee out there trying to find all the venues, saying this is what we want to do and this is the stage design we're gonna we're gonna go with this new stage and and do this and that and and new it gives stage. them plenty of time. Well, that's what I'm expecting a new stage. They don't put uh, a new stage then. Uh, this they're, has they're, they're monitors right in the amplifiers. You know this, this, is, this is more I, of I our plumbing scaffolding. Or I call it out. <laughs> but this time it's going to be painted. And it's not going to be metallic. Like We're going to have, <laughs> we're going to have the same old war, more war machine screen art going. That we've had for the last six years. No, no more. No, we need new videos, too. I want new videos, new everything. You're asking even a lot new, from them. even new costumes. Ken, this is Kiss we're talking it, about. I want new costumes also. On this, we're going to go out with a bang. This time the armor's a darker shade. <laughs> the army speaks. Jean's costume's <laughs> different. It's a darker shade. <laughs> <laughs> they painted it black. The voice of reason has spoken. There you go. <laughs> so if you hear and you obey, get to it. <laughs> yeah. get, get to the hearing and get to obeying alright uh, let's kind of leave that one there and hit, head into one of these others, other topics that we've got today um, Mark I, I think that one uh, I mentioned to you would be a good one to kind of go into now oh okay so uh, I guess the running idea was what we feel is the most catchiest Kiss song in their catalog so um, that actually is kind of a tricky question, I think, because what, what I think is their best song may not necessarily be the catchiest song in my eyes. You know, sometimes catchy, when I think catchy, I think commercial, something that hooks me right away, something that has a really strong chorus. And sometimes some of the Kiss songs that I really love don't have that. Like 100,000 Years is a really awesome song. I've always loved that song, but I wouldn't say that has a catchy chorus or anything like that, right? So... For me, I'll always, I'm always going to stick with this song because for me, I've always thought it was a really, really strong song, um, and you know, I, I've always thought it exemplified a really good commercial song. And now I'm, the title is just dropped out of my fucking head. It's can't be that read, catchy. Yeah, read right? my can't body. Be that <laughs> <laughs> no, not read my body. That's off of that Crazy catchy. Nights. Uh, second last song. Uh, what's the, Turn on that. Uh, okay, this is gonna be, it. This is gonna be ten. Go. Oh, oh, he got it like on Jeopardy, the first. Right? It's like Jeopardy, second to last song. Yeah, it's a good song. Yeah. That's it. That's the song that okay. I think is to me. I think is their cat. One of their cat. In fact, probably was their one of their catchiest songs I think I've ever heard. So, and I think it has everything. It's it's memorable, even though I couldn't remember the title there. Um, it it it. <laughs> It's, it is it's, memorable. It's, memorable. It's, it's memorable, but I can't remember what it's, it's called. Memorable. I can't remember. I can't remember what it is right now. But gosh, yeah, it's good. <laughs> but I mean, musically, it is, and it has some of Paul's best singing. And you know, I, I really think it. You know, they had enough confidence in to make a video. So I think it's a. It had everything that they were kind of gunning for, as far as a catchy song, is concerned. So, what do you think? <laughs> Shit. That's, that's a good song. I think it's a good song. A, I would I would choose choice. it as a catch this kiss song in my opinion, but it's a good song. It's catchy, but it's not. I don't. I wouldn't consider it the catchiest kiss song. Oh no, I'm not saying that you would. I saying that for me. Everyone right? has their own. Like, well, everybody has their own thing. Okay, yeah. okay, Lonnie. If that's, if, if, that, if yeah, that's if not for you, what's your catchiest kiss song? Three Anything for my baby. Body. Oh, that's pretty up tempo, <laughs> happy clappy. Catchy, catchy. It is memorable and it is catchy. I'm okay. thinking still. Okay. I'm surprised it wasn't something from Revenge. Yeah, because oh. that's, that's just well, full of up tempo, yeah. catchy songs. Catchy songs, yeah. No, if I mean, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not so close minded. <laughs> okay. What about um, you, Julian? Um, actually, the one that immediately comes to mind is one of my least favorite songs in the catalog, and it shouted out loud. It's mm. catchy as hell. It's catchy as hell, though. With, right. with its with its vocals and everything, and you know, as much as I like Mark's pick, I just couldn't kind of think of anything from the non originals era to kind of to put out there. So I knew it was going to be 
that or, you know, come on and love me. Shit. Come on and love me is right there, too. Yeah. Shout it out loud, though. I mean, I have to agree about that because even from the very beginning, that introductory guitar line, even the bass line that's with it is so catchy. That's with it. That whole melody at the beginning just reels you in. I remember the very first time I heard that song. I thought that that was probably one of the rare songs off of that album that I actually thought was pretty catchy the first time I heard it, right? So it's it's, it's definitely one of those things. And I think that they had that in mind with Bob when they were working at it at his apartment there on the piano. They probably wanted something that catchy, you know, a Motownish kind of song, you know? Well, to me, and uh, Craig Smith, I think uh, Pods and Sots is working on a book on this band and its music. Makes me think of the monkeys. Shout it out mm. loud. The sort of really kind of happy, mm-hmm. TV safe, you know, radio friendly unit shifter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. All right, Ken, well, you, thinking, you, you've had enough time. Co- had long enough. Yeah, you know, the first thing that really came to <laughs> uh, one of the first things was shout it out loud, like you said, Julian. But the other one, it's, it's going to sound like a big cop out. Is uh, I was uh, not I was going to be but. Uh, Rock and roll all night. It is. Um, I mean, that's why it was uh, one of their first hits. And to me, when I first heard that song back off of when I bought, uh, you know, Just to Kill, um, that was my favorite song off of that initially. I mean, it was just, to me, it was very catchy and it's, you know, it's an anth- another anthem and anthems have to be catchy, I think. So it's, kind of a cop out but that's that's the one i think it's interesting that that julian brought up come on love me i brought up anything for my baby and ken brought up rock and roll night all three off address to kill produced by neil bogart who's king of thing pop. was catching poppy singles that's true mm-hmm. the legend of neil bogart lives yeah right. good point but I thought, that's very very good point because like you said that that was his bread and butter before all this happened he was mm-hmm. You know, I think what was it? Wasn't it Buddha he was working with when he did yeah, that he stuff? Was, he was uh, for Buddha, and he'd uh, produced. You know, what he'd been a part of or involved in or stolen ninety six tears or question mark. Um, shit, I can't even remember all the bands that he worked with. But chewing gum company, or whatever that was. Nineteen ten fruit gum. Fruit gum. Yeah. That's it. So, that was it. Right. Exactly. Those kind of. Holy shit! One so, hit wonders. Yeah. So yeah. Dress to Kill is a very kind of pop record, so catchy, short anthems, and I guess when you're pushed for time writing-wise, it's kind of easy to fall back into formulaic, um, kind of, oh, let's write a song like, okay, and just kind of do it that way, right? Yeah, and, and, and it's funny for all the, the kind of negative talk people used to have about that record, I think overall, you know, Neil Bogart should get a lot of you know, praise for that record. He, I think, consider all things considered, it turned out really good. There's catchy songs on it. The production of it is a lot better than Hotter Than Hell, obviously. And you know, now years and years later, it's one of these records that a lot of people, you know, s- seem to say is their favorite. I know jo- Jody Havenot from a podcast, Rock City, says that it's his favorite album of all time. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you guys aren't the only ones who have this thought about it. It's lots of people have this thought that it's such a um, strong album. And it has, you know, the pop sensibility is kind of the thing that he likes too, which is interesting because I know Jody likes a lot of the kind of punk music. But punk music also, to some degree, has an element of that kind of catchiness into it as well. So yeah. it, it makes total sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I've talked about it with other people, or maybe even on this show, you know, about the punk stuff. Glenn Matlock was involved in The Rich Kids. That was super pop um, afterwards when he hooked up with Midger, um, Steve New. So really good stuff. Another one, you know, just throw out there for discussion is Tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, really catchy. that's another one. That's yeah. a great one. Definitely yeah. another one. And and that would be a, a great lead in just to the final kind of topic for today. And we'll just do a, a few albums. You pick the maybe two albums that you want to, uh, the wrong choices for singles, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think on Unmasked, for me, Shandy was definitely the very worst first single you could have picked off that album. And Tomorrow would have been the most perfect of, you know, if it was going to, if it had to be a Paul song. Um, building off the success of the mm-hmm. previous album, Tomorrow 
I, I just would have thought would have been a complete slayer because um, it was just so catchy. And it was the sort of song that I would have thought would have had a similar response that uh, I Was Made had the year before, <clears throat> that it was friendly enough to make people maybe go, well, who the hell's that? Wait, that's yeah. Kiss? You know, and to give yeah, them exactly. that, that inroad into the AOR that they were looking for much more than kind of the syrupy, sicky, sickly Shandy. And it's not mm -hmm. that Shandy's not a great song, a great performance uh, mm -hmm. or anything. It's just, to me, it's the wrong dynamics, again, being represented. You still have to have some energy and more energy than emotion when it comes to Kiss. So uh, that would be my first album that I replaced. Ken, what about you? What's an album and a song? I, that, that I agree. Know? Yeah. Uh, for, well, first album I'll pick is from the first album. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I think Strutter should have been released as a as a single. I mean, it has that mm -hmm. you know Rolling Stones -y vibe to it, and and they were still pretty hot, you know, early '70s. They were doing really well there too. So I think it's a better one than uh, was it Nothing to Lose, mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about you know that that subject. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone figured it out, um, maybe that's why they didn't play it on the radio. I don't know, um, but I think Strutter is. Wait, what? Nothing to lose. Very, why very why they didn't play it on the radio? Probably because they figured out what it was about. I mean, geez. exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so, now, um, now to our Folgers commercial. But first, nothing to lose. But first, <laughs> well, it could have been with the commercial of you know Preparation H or something. You know, it made more sense. <laughs> Nice. Good product placement. Hey. Yeah, let's not talk about product <laughs> product placement. And... <laughs> Please, no. No, no, no. Oh, oh shit. Oh, I was going to say shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, this has degenerated quickly. Lonnie, save us. Isn't it? Oh. You just mute the problem. Um... <laughs> I'm going to say Lick It Up, and I would have chosen, I mean, obviously, Lick It Up as a single is a great choice, I mean, and it worked well for them. But I was, I would still think a, a Million to One should have been a single off of Lick It Up. And I think it could have done very well for them um, coming off of taking off the makeup and the success of the single Lick It Up. I'm, it always perplexed me that that was not a single off of Lick It Up, because it's such a strong song. And Maybe it's just because, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know why. Because, I mean, just, be, handled, just because, damn it. Yeah, just because. It's, it's so good. And the whole theory of you, you, you release a, a rocker and then you release a ballad, mm -hmm. it, it would have worked perfectly for Lick It Up. And I, I don't get it. Did they just not want to play the song live so they didn't release it as a single? Why? I don't, I don't know. But it, it sounded great live when Paul played it in 06 on the Live the Wind Tour. It sounded absolutely fantastic live. So that always that always perplexed me. It's why why not that song? Because it's so strong. Hmm. I, I mean, I think uh, I, I, I think I agree that "Lick It Up" shouldn't have been the first single from that. But I I, I really kind of think that they should have gone with "All Hells" as the first single, just because it was different at the rock rap kind of thing going a little bit more, and it was just different enough that it could have stood out a bit more, and then gone to say a million to one is the power ballad and then finish it up with lick it up being the third single. Sure. One, two, three punch. So, <clears throat> all right. Uh, Mark. Okay. Well, it's, it's funny. Uh, Lonnie took the one I was going to originally say, but uh, um, what I'm going to choose though, because I did have a backup um, is, and this one always kind of, I found kind of interesting as to why they chose this one, but, I'm going to go back to the second record, Hotter Than Hell. Um, I know Let Me Go Rock and Roll was chosen, chosen to be the single off of that album. And I always thought that that was sort of a not a very strong song. It just seems so very Joe, so Joe Average song. It's like a 12 bar kind of, you know, basic kind of song. Now, not good. to say now, not to say that this is a, you know, complicated song or something but i honestly think that a song like got to choose would have been a better selection for a, a single than let me go rock and roll i think it's catchier um i think that paul sings it really well and it's one of the songs that i think the production of that record 
doesn't really hinder it as much as some of the other songs. Like I think songs like, you know, Going Blind and Coming Home really suffer from that kind of muddy production. Whereas something like, you know, Got to Choose uh, is, a you know, can kind of accept that sort of, you know, raunchy kind of production on that song. It's kind of that kind of, you know, raunchy sort of tune. So I think that would have been a good selection instead of Let Me Go Rock and Roll. Interesting pick, I think. You know, you talk about that, Mark. I always thought uh, I agree with that. Living Go Rock and Roll shouldn't have been the lead single. I think it probably should have been, to me, it should have been like Hotter Than Hell. Mm. That was the one that I enjoyed most when I first heard that album. But uh, you're, you're, you're right about that. It's, that song was probably a wrong choice. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm going to do a second pick, uh, I'm going to just do a blast this one out. Turn on the night should have been the first single from Crazy Night. I said that so many times. Uh, wrong single, wrong order. Yeah. Again, I, again, I don't have a problem with the the singles themselves as they were chosen for Crazy Nights, but I think Turn on the Night should have been the first, then the Power Ballad, and again, just like I did with the Lick It Up album, um, you know, finish it up with Crazy Crazy Nights. I think it would have been a, a far better sequence of singles than what they used. Lonnie, I want to do one final one, and then we'll... Uh... I'll do one final one, and I've mentioned this on the show before. Um, and that's Monster. And I know you could say, oh, well, that's... Mm. You know, it, w- it would have would it have sparked sales more if there was a different lead single? No, probably not. And, like, the same, um, you know, part of the community was going to buy it regardless of what the lead single was. But I think, and I've said this on the show before, that the album should have been called wall of sound and wall of sound should have been the first song the first song on the album mm-hmm. and the lead single to have a gene song you know you, you went the path with with paul stanley having the lead song the lead single off sonic boom why not have a gene song be the lead single off of the follow-up album and you could say well wall of sound isn't as strong of a song as hell hallelujah well that's debatable i think hell hallelujah is fine but i wouldn't call it a modern classic as someone would call it, um, I, I think Wallace. I think if you if you rearrange a song on songs on Monster and make Wallace sound the first song on the album, I think the album has a whole different feel to it. So that'd be that'd be my pick. It's Wallace sound off Monster to be the lead single off that. Interesting. I mean, it's not my least favorite song off the record, that's for sure, and it is probably one of the more interesting Gene songs. And you're right; it would have given it a totally different vibe to the record because you know the hell or hallelujah is kind of an almost expected type of song from paul you're expecting that type of introduction yeah exactly so to start with something completely different like that might have give it a whole different flavor or feel right and it wouldn't have changed a single thing like lonnie said (laughs) right (laughs) it wouldn't have changed no you're exactly it it just it it just would it would have made gene happy it wouldn't Hmm. have sold a another album than what it did it wouldn't have made one difference in sales but i think it would have been really cool to do it that way yeah no i agree it, you know and the only thing that would have changed the whole thing is if maybe they called the album freak and released freak as a single and if lady gaga did a now that would have with Paul sales, you would have had a platinum album yeah and it would have yeah. went to number one they would have that first week yeah definitely but anyway. and they, yeah and they would have had their number one album yeah yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm agreeing. I'm just shaking my head sadly that it didn't you know, happen. That it didn't happen. That it, it's just one of those missed opportunities. And maybe it's something that they could go back and get her to do and put it out as a record. No, why? Why even suggest it? We're not going to do it. But you know, <laughs> it's just oh, this band that we love. It's- Sense the frustration from you. They've never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. That's for sure. Yeah, perfect. So my second pick, and I, I guess I have asked ask a question here. Uh, was there a, a single, there was a single released from Unplugged, right? Yeah, a radio yeah. single of, uh, what was it? Every time Rock and Roll I, All Night. Every time I look at you. That's the one, right. Uh, combo uh, with Rock and Roll All Night. So. Mm-hmm. Right. Um well, I think that was a good, semi-good release because it's actually turned out better than the Revenge version, in my opinion. But I think uh, Going Blind was a a great version off of that 
unplug because it was done justice from where you know hotter than hell like mark said is that muddy sound it just didn't it didn't work right you know even though it's a great song there but in the acoustic uh, performance of it man that's just that's my favorite performance of going blind i mean that that's the one that i would have used as a as a single hmm i mean yeah why not? Not that it would have sold anything. No, it, but at that time period, but uh, at that time it would have mattered. I mean, you, I think we could probably pick any song from Unplugged and say that it's the finest representation. Uh, I mean, I oh, when yeah. you, when you uh, mentioned Unplugged, I immediately thought, oh, say sure no something. Right, that's another one. You know, because that was a failure when you know issued as a single, but the Unplugged that's when one, they should have done Charisma instead on Off a Dynasty. And as much as I like Revenge, every time I look at you off of Unplugged, it's awesome as well. And I still love you. There's so many good songs on, on Unplugged. Yeah. All right. So let's leave that one there. We're uh, pretty much out of time for today. So that's a good bunch of topics. Wherever you listen to the Kiss FAU podcast, chime in with your selections for the several questions that we've asked ourselves. Oh, is that the, the new ad? That's an ad uh, out of Goldmine. Right, awesome. So, Case is new out. Yeah. So th those will be disappearing, and you'll be seeing them ripped apart and sold on eBay for nine ninety nine just for the single page ad. So, yeah. <laughs> no, that that's very cool. I'm looking forward to Spaceman now, and uh, Ace is starting to talk a little bit more about the album whenever he opens his mouth. So more more info to start coming out. I I think. Uh, who was it? Carl Linnaeus did an interview with him, and he asked him about the differences between Pursuit of Rock and Roll and the Psycho Circus song and that shared a title. So there should be a lot more info coming out over the next, uh, well, until it's released next month. So, mm -hmm. all right. So as I was saying, uh, wherever you listen to us, chime in with your answers and selections and your thoughts on the topics that we've uh, discussed today. We always like to read your opinions. And uh, do go back and check out the last episode from the Rock and Pod for those interviews, as I, I think they're worth your time. Uh, but for now, from Ken, from Mark, Lonnie, and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Peace out. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final, there are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.